Okay. Uh, morning, everyone. I am Sue Ann. I'm the coordinator of the Regional Strategic and Political Studies Program here at IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you to this opening panel on playing the great game, um, which will focus on how ASEAN member states and ASEAN as an institution can navigate the intensifying great power rivalry in the region. Um, Minister Vivian has given us a um, kind of like a rousing and inspiring and optimistic um, picture of ASEAN's continued relevance. Uh, we're going to camp on this central question um, a little bit and hear from our speakers indeed on whether or not ASEAN has the capacity and the nimbleness to re maintain its relevance in the midst of an increasingly crowded regional arena in which middle powers, not just the superpowers, are seeking to play an active and activist role in the regional balance of power. Um, we're honored to have with us a very distinguished panel uh, to share their insights on these issues. Professor Kishore Mabubani is no stranger to us and probably needs very little introduction. He is a veteran diplomat and prominent public intellectual. He is currently distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Institute at NUS and was the founding dean of the LKY School of Public Policy where he served for 13 years between 2004 to 2017. Professor Mabubani writes and speaks prolifically on the rise of Asia, geopolitics and global governance. His latest books, Has China Won? and The Asian 21st Century were released in March 2020 and January 2022. Our next panelist, Dr. Evan Laxmana, is Senior Research Fellow at the Center on Asia and Globalization at the LKY School of Public Policy. He was previously senior, senior researcher at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, in Indonesia, and a Wong Kong Wu visiting fellow at ICES. And last but not least, my colleague, Dr. William Chung, is senior fellow at ICES and managing editor of the Institute's Fulcrum Commentary website. Prior to joining ICES, William was a senior fellow at IISS, where he helped to organize the annual Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. William was also formerly a journalist with The Straits Times, where he worked as senior writer responsible for opinion pieces and editorials focused on defense, diplomacy, and US policy in Asia. Our speakers will speak for about 15 minutes, after which we will open the floor to questions and answers. For those of you who are in the room, please make your way to the mics uh, located around the room, and I will um, acknowledge you. And for those of you who are joining us online, please do feel free to post your questions on the Q&A chat box, and we'll try our best to get to them. So without further delay, let me now hand the floor over to Professor Kishore for his remarks. Thank you. Uh, Minister Vivian Balakrishnan, Ching Kwok, Mr. Klein, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, Americans begin with a joke. <laughs> uh, Asians begin with an apology. And I want to begin with a genuine apology, especially to some ambassadors in this room. But if my remarks make you uncomfortable, I want to apologize in advance. But you all know that the world that is coming is going to be so uncomfortable that if you're not preparing for this discomfort, you're preparing yourself for an illusion. So this is why I'm afraid, with apologies to everyone in the room, I'm going to be trying to be in direct as frank as ever. And I want to begin, in some ways, many of my remarks I hope will complement uh, what the minister has said, especially about the US-China contest. And I can tell you that I've been, I guess, involved in geopolitics in one, one way or another since I joined the foreign ministry in 1971, 51 years ago. And this is by far, 
the most difficult geopolitical environment I have ever dealt with in 51 years. And as, there, it's very dangerous to make predictions about the future, but I can guarantee you one thing <laughs> with absolute certainty. Relations between US and China will get worse in the next 10 years. And I say this to some extent with greater confidence. I just spent four weeks in the US and Europe and came back just over the weekend. And just yesterday, uh, I heard someone say, who had just come from Washington, DC, he says on the US-China subject, Washington, DC is divided between the hawkish voices and the irresponsibly hawkish voices. There are no doves in the Washington, DC on US and China. And you've seen already, right, the moves that have been taken in the tech war, the CHIPS Act. And this obviously are going to, go, all these things are going to create major disruptions. It will affect ASEAN countries, for sure, right? What happens if, you're, if you have a factory in an ASEAN country exporting to both US and China? Just imagine you've got to comply with the CHIPS Act and guarantee that nothing in your product comes from China. It creates all kinds of remarkable difficulties, and this is just the beginning. As you all know, the Republicans are likely to win the House, right? Maybe even the Senate. Then all bets are off. There'll be even more dangerous legislation. There's something called the Taiwan Policy Act that is working its way through the Congress, which will have to evoke a ballistic response from China. So I'm just saying all these. <laughs> these things are going to happen. So get ready. Life is going to be very difficult. And there's no, no doubt whatsoever, and this is also what the minister said, that ASEAN, as you know, is geographically the closest to China, and we will be affected clearly by this incredibly difficult environment. So the question, therefore, is for us, what should we do? Should we remain passive? Or should we start doing something much more aggressively to prepare for this storm? And I actually believe very simply and I, that we cannot afford to be passive. Because as I want to emphasize that ASEAN will be directly affected by this growing uh, US-China contest. And let's start preparing for the storm now. And start doing things to protect ourselves as this storm gains momentum over the next uh, 10 years. But to do that, I believe that we have to follow uh, three rules. By the way, I noticed, Suan, there's no clock here, so I'm not... I hope you are. Can you, can you monitor for me? You know, when you give a former diplomat a mic, he can talk for two hours, you know. <laughs> but I want to finish in exactly 15 minutes. <laughs> I don't know how many, time, how many minutes I've completed so far. Um, so let me talk about these three rules, because I think, I hope that these three rules will help ASEAN deal with a very difficult environment. And the first rule is that ASEAN's got to become much more self-confident. I say this because I'm very deeply troubled when ASEAN representatives speak, half the time they're apologizing over ASEAN. Oh, yes, yes, we are not that great. We are not that you know, wonderful. You know, we are behind the European Union. You know, please excuse us. You know? And I think it's time for us to drop this apologetic tone uh, when speaking about ASEAN because in many respects, ASEAN has now outperformed all the other regional organizations in the world, including, frankly, the European Union. Now, let me emphasize that the European Union is a wonderful organization, really has performed great miracles, delivered tremendous uh, benefits for Europe. But clearly, by any standards, if you take the key areas in delivering peace, prosperity, and some degree of harmony, 
ASEAN is now ahead of the European Union. Okay? You want to talk of peace? I mean, I agree that we have troubles in Myanmar. Clearly, and the minister spelled them out very, very clearly. In Myanmar cannot be solved in the next 10, 20 years. It will take time. But compare Ukraine to Myanmar. If Myanmar is X, Ukraine is 10X or 20X. Now, I completely agree that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is illegal. It violates the UN Charter. We should condemn it. But all students of geopolitics know that when wars happen, they reflect geopolitical incompetence of the highest order. And there were so many warnings in the build-up to Ukraine, including by very eminent people like Henry Kissinger, whom I actually met 10 days ago, sorry, two weeks ago in New York. Lots of people have been warning. The warnings were ignored. And that's how you have this massive conflict in Ukraine, which is not just destabilizing Europe, destabilizing the whole world. And come on, by contrast, ASEAN is doing a much better job. It's a much more difficult region to try and preserve peace. And then in terms of prosperity, let me tell you what the minister has given some wonderful statistics about what ASEAN has done. Let me just add one more. The European Union's combined GNP is $15 trillion. ASEAN's only $3 trillion, one-fifth of the European Union. But over the 10-year period, 2010 to 2020, which regional organization, European Union or ASEAN, contributed more to global economic growth? The correct answer is ASEAN. It's actually quite remarkable what we have done, and as the minister said, the potential for ASEAN is enormous. Whereas Europe is going to be stuck with slow growth. And I haven't mentioned something else, right? If anybody had predicted 10 years ago which organization will break apart first, ASEAN or EU, everyone would say ASEAN. Guess what? Brexit happened in the EU. And the disaster of Brexit, the consequences are just beginning. <laughs> You've seen this with the way how, how quickly they changed the prime ministers. It reflects a deeper malaise you know, as a result of the refusal to deal with realities of the new world. And we have no Brexit in ASEAN. And finally, in terms of harmony, I can tell you that ASEAN is genuinely a miracle because the degree of trust and confidence among societies which are the most different in the world cannot be replicated anywhere else in the world. I mean, let me just emphasize a simple point, okay? Out of 660 million uh, people in ASEAN, you have 250 million Muslims, 150 million Christians, 150 million Buddhists, Mahayana Buddhists, Hinayana Buddhists, Taoists, Confucianists, Hindus, and we have lots of communists too. Guess what? We get along. And the European Union, till today, cannot admit a single Islamic member. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? In a world that is becoming multipolar, multi civilizational, there's no better role model than ASEAN. So I say all this because I want to emphasize that ASEAN needs to speak with a far more confident voice in dealing with the challenges that are coming. So the second rule I would say, that the second rule I think we should observe is that we should be proactive. And as you know, the minister said, Singapore has made it very clear to both US and China that we don't want to choose. We want to be friends with US, we want to be friends uh, with China. That is actually the view of all 10 ASEAN states. But how many of them speak up? How many of them say this openly or loudly? Not enough. And frankly, given how, you know, the great, as you know, the, all great powers suffer from something which is called great power autism. 
they only listen to themselves and have great difficulties listening to the rest of the world. And if you speak softly and apologetically to Washington DC or Beijing, your views will not be heard at all. So you've got you to bang the door and say very loudly, we are, we are going to make it very clear to you, don't come to us to choose, we don't want to choose. And we've got to make that as clearly as possible, as loudly as possible, and do so before they trust the choice upon us. And that trust is going to come. So we've got to defend ourselves by speaking loudly and clearly in the next 10 years. And I hope that the 10 ASEAN countries will find ways and means of being far more assertive. And the third rule I would mention is that, frankly, it's not just the ASEAN countries that are troubled by this US-China contest. Many parts of the world, I, you know, I, I can tell you many parts of Africa are deeply troubled by this US-China contest. I had the privilege of having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, when he came to Singapore a few weeks ago, and he made it very, very clear. He said, we Africans, we don't want to choose. We want to work with the United States, and we want to work uh, with China. That's true also even in Latin America, which traditionally has been an American sphere of influence. And even take the largest economy, Brazil, it took Brazil 20 years ago, one year to export $1 billion to China. Now it takes Brazil 72 hours to export $1 billion to China. That's how integrated Latin America has also become with China. So the rest of the world, many in the global south, don't want to take sides. They also want to say, we want to work with US, we want to work with China. So one thing that ASEAN can do and the question is, can ASEAN remain relevant? ASEAN can remain relevant by getting a larger global coalition to come together. Let's work together to constrain these two elephants before they disrupt our entire world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof Kisho, for that very rousing pep talk that we have a lot going for us and we shouldn't be too apologetic. Um, about our future. Um, let me just hand the floor over now to Evan, um, who will address us. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Minister uh, Vivian, uh, Mr. Choi. Uh, let me first thank ISIS uh, for giving me uh, the opportunity uh, to speak today. Um, like Kishore, I would like to begin with a, se a series of apologies as well. Um, I think he is always a tough act to follow, so if I look uh, very much under par compared to him. I sincerely apologize for that as well. And let me also apologize um, for taking on a more critical tone of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific uh, that Minister Vivian um, has kindly uh, spoke about earlier. I think for now, uh, the central question about what's next uh, for the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific is simply this. How do we get the ASEAN outlook to move from what is now today a reference point uh, used in diplomatic meetings and statements into a genuine agenda setter that's driving uh, uh, not just processes but also shaping uh, strategic outcomes within the broader Indo-Pacific. And I think this is a key, a key point because uh, many uh, region analysts have mentioned today that there are some benefits and values of the asset outlook on Indo-Pacific today. It is certainly being used a lot more uh, uh, in, in various conversations as opposed to uh, simply following the existing uh, um, a reference point of free and open Indo-Pacific or others. Uh, but I think to answer that question, how do we move away from a reference point to a, an agenda setter, there are three basic problems uh, that I feel uh, we in ASEAN have to address uh, uh, head on. First, we have to admit that the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific was born with flawed assumptions. The first flawed assumption is that ASEAN mechanism alone is sufficient to change uh, strategic outcomes. It is necessary, I would argue, but it is not sufficient. Number two, uh, the flawed assumption number two is the idea that simply restating existing norms and principles within the ASEAN outlook, which we all have agreed on over the last two decades, 
would be necessary to generate momentum. And as we have seen, it is only a driving momentum in the diplomatic uh, speeches and statement, but it hasn't really changed the major dynamics. And Kishore have, have, um, have clearly pointed out the US-China uh, dynamics in particular has remained unchanged uh, since we had the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. The third uh, flawed assumption is that the convening of ASEAN meetings alone and the insertion of the ASEAN outlook uh, in various statements is proof of ASEAN's leadership. Uh, chairmanship and convening power alone is not leadership. And I think this is where uh, uh, the flawed assumptions of, of ASEAN Outlook's uh, policy formulation, which began in Jakarta, I think continues uh, to haunt us because the idea that these three um, key assumptions, uh, that ASEAN is sufficient, that restating existing norms, and that convening meetings and documents is sufficient, underlines a reality that we still hope that this is sufficient to change strategic outcome. But as uh, many others have said, hope is not a strategy. A second uh, key problem with the ASEAN outlook that I feel we need to address is the reality that at the beginning there's a lot more support uh, for the ASEAN outlook from external partners rather than within ASEAN themselves. And this is um, kind of reminiscing of the debates that I hope we will have later on about the myths that there are two ASEANs between maritime um, and, and, and mainland or between democracy or not or between develop or not. Uh, but this notion that there was a lack of collective support within ASEAN uh, when it was uh, first pushed in 2018, I think uh, uh, is, is a key problem. Um, the third uh, key problem is Indonesia's own leadership now as we move forward to become chair next year and what do we do uh, with the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. Right now, it seems to me that the existing ideas for the furthering of the ASEAN outlook hinges on processes, again, not outcomes, in two ways. One is sort of implementing the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific as interpreted by convening of the ASEAN, uh, of, of the Indo-Pacific Infrastructure Summit, uh, which the foreign minister has suggested uh, at the UNGA. A second way to focus on process is the need to mainstream uh, the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. This is to make it much more widely usable, um, and in fact, it would probably be one of the headlines of the ASEAN-related uh, mechanisms and agendas and meetings uh, moving forward. Uh, Relabeling an existing program and, and meeting or activities as ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific meetings is, of course, a, uh, a, a bureaucratic sleight of hand because it really doesn't change the fact that we don't have a strategy, resources, or way forward to actually change uh, strategic outcomes. And I think this is not uh, a fatal uh, a problem with the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific. As I've said earlier, it remains an important reference point. But how do we make it more than just a reference point? I think three potential uh, way forward uh, uh, is worth thinking and, and debating about. First. For me, rather than looking at the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific as necessarily yet another expansion of the ASEAN way uh, to engage the broader region, we should actually start improving uh, the network quality between ASEAN member states themselves. So the idea that we need to focus only on the dialogue partner support uh, for the ASEAN outlook, I think, um, uh, is, is flawed because I think the first key priority for Indonesia and, and whoever chair ASEAN next is to focus focused on gaining support within um, ASEAN itself for the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. A second uh, difficult uh, way forward is, of course, uh, something that we have been debating for the last few years, is whether or not the ASEAN Charter uh, requires revision. Now, there is a clause in the ASEAN Charter about reviewing uh, the Charter uh, five years after it's ratified, but we haven't really done that. Reviewing the implementation of the ASEAN Charter through the ASEAN-led uh, mechanisms that Vietnam proposed a couple of years ago is not equivalent to discussing the provisions of the ASEAN Charter. Now, of course, we also have the High Level Task Force 2025. Most of the difficult questions surrounding the ASEAN Charter has been pushed into this particular basket, uh, whether it's about improving ASEAN institutional capacity, uh, do we need to develop our own crisis management mechanism separate from dispute resolution, do we need to develop ways to uh, further institutionalize the East Asia Summit, or to actually take on the idea that was uh, within 
uh, the ASEAN outlook on Indo-Pacific, which is an IORA East Asia Summit engagement. Now, these are, of course, uh, difficult questions, uh, but uh, going back to my initial theme, that there is no confidence, as Kishore mentioned, about ASEAN before we fix uh, what's uh, uh, been challenging within ASEAN itself, both in terms of the relationship uh, between ASEAN member states and support for the ASEAN outlook, as well as the broader institutional umbrella uh, through the ASEAN Charter. And the last one uh, is more about uh, a question mark, the extent to which ASEAN as a group and the individual Southeast Asian states actually have a strategy to engage the broader Indian Ocean region. While Southeast Asia is between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, uh, I think it is safe to say for the last few decades, most of our tilt has been on the Pacific rather than on the Indian Ocean. Um, and this, I think, allows us to think about it more deeply if we want to uh, consider uh, 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 engaging minilateral uh, institutions. Uh, it's not just the Quad. We also have BIMSTAC, in which uh, some ASEAN members uh, are also a part of, um, do we need to improve Indonesia's own relationship with India, which I think for me is one of the more interesting puzzles uh, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, that India and Indonesia are not uh, stronger strategic partners. But without a clear blueprint uh, on the Indian Ocean region, and of course uh, the Indian Ocean region being uh, much more closer to the interests of the mainland Southeast Asian states, the ASEAN outlook once again can be a momentum uh, to actually build up and strengthen intra-ASEAN um, strategic engagement. And with that, I think uh, these key problems and, 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 and key potential forward, I think should give us some sense of the challenges ahead, uh, but these are not insurmountable challenges. And if ASEAN were to be relevant, I think we have to take a step back and accept that perhaps, just perhaps, the expansion of the ASEAN way beyond uh, the region in the early 2000s may have been done a little bit too fast and too furious, and now the ASEAN outlook actually gives us a momentum to improve our own uh, engagement and relationship within ASEAN and move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. That was a very useful and constructive counterpoint, I think, um, on treatment of, of the challenges. Um, uh, William, next, and William, uh, you yeah, you can remain seated there if you like. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me, uh, Mr. Choi, Minister, and ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Um, I prefer to sit down because in the past three years uh, we've been attending so many Zoom meetings sitting down, so I prefer to speak sitting down. Um, so uh, thanks to have Kishore and Evan here. Um, Kishore, as a student and as an ex-journalist, I scribbled down copious notes earlier, and I, you said you had three points about ASEAN. ASEAN being pro, three rules. ASEAN being proactive, ASEAN being um, more confident, and I think I lost your third one. Um, so, okay, the, yeah, but never mind. We, 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 yeah. Number two, be proactive. Number yeah. three, create a global code. All right, okay. Okay, thanks for that. So, you know, it's always good to ask the question first uh, rather than deliver the comments. So thanks for that, Kishore. Um, so the question that I was given today was um, the Quad and the, the implications on the Quad on ASEAN's relevance. So I think it was uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald who said that the test of the first rate intelligence is to be able to keep two opposing ideas in your head and retain ability to function. So I'm going to give you three opposing ideas, and um, that's probably going to make you lose some sanity. But I'm going to give you three answers. Uh, whether the Quad under, um, undermines ASEAN, and my answer is yes, no, and maybe. So I'm going to let you decide um, what the answer is going to be at the end of my 15 minutes. Um, what is the Quad? The Quad. Um, I'm going to say what it's not. It's not a military alliance. It's not a formal military alliance. But as the four Quad members, Australia, Japan, India, and United States have said, it's a force for good. And they use a shorthand called the rules-based order, which Minister and Kishore have mentioned. And I'll say the rules-based international order is a, what you call a term that keeps on giving because you can take whatever interpretation you want even from it. 
So the U.S. and its Quad allies would like to emphasize kind of the democratic element, the, the political and strategic element of the rules-based international order. But ASEAN member states, I think they would like to emphasize the trade-related, the multilateral trade-related kind of elements of, of the order. But, you know, with the principles that the Quad is espousing uh, in the so-called free and open Indo-Pacific, um, the principles are kind of motherhood statements that nobody would really disagree with. Um, respect for sovereignty, which uh, Minister and Kishore had mentioned, peaceful resolution of disputes, free, fair and reciprocal trade, and that's a Trump era term that has been dropped by the Biden administration, and of course, adherence to international rules, including freedom of navigation and overflight. So unless you've been in a cave in the past five years, it's not hard for you to figure out there's an anti-China slant in, in the language of the Quad. And um, it was Shinzo Abe, um, the late Shinzo Abe, who said that an overriding principle of the Indo-Pacific should be the rule of law. And he, he used very uh, kind of lyrical language about a rich bustle continual that supports the melody played in a bright and cheery key. And I think it was an Australian analyst who was quite cheeky when he remarked that with such an orchestra, China would be hard pressed to get the job of playing the triangle, let alone, let alone playing the conductor. Um, so let me go into, does the Quad undermine ASEAN? And I'll say yes, because if ASEAN centrality is a, is a construct, uh, a vision of regional order where the collective interest of ASEAN comes first, and is at least regarded. Um, I would argue that major powers, uh, be it the US or China, they profess ASEAN centrality, but in actually in action and their behavior, they do whatever suits uh, their interests. So I'll say that what the Quad is giving to ASEAN is what you call a backhanded compliment. It's what I call respectful disrespect, in the sense that they, use, they mouth the shibboleth of ASEAN centrality to achieve their respective goals, um, to, you know, to get entrance into ASEAN and do whatever they like. And I'd like to give three examples. The first one is free and open um, Indo-Pacific strategy. And you know, most people do not have a problem with the, the principles. You know, again, freedom of navigation, adherence to international law, uh, regional connectivity. But you know, there's, there's a problem. I mean, uh, like I say, unless you were born in the last century, all ASEAN member states know that the language that is being used is, is used in kind of a geostrategic, geopolitical language. And I think that's the very reason why um, you don't see ASEAN member countries actually coming out to support FOIP, uh, at least in the FOIP brand. That's why, like Evan is saying, um, ASEAN has come out with its own ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Um, as what you call a rearguard action uh, to, to the US-led uh, FOIP. The second point I'd like to make is, of course, the Quad is not a military alliance, but it's the only coalition that can bring hard power to bear, especially when you have disputes um, in, in the region, um, most in particular the South China Sea disputes. We, we've seen that it actually highlights ASEAN's inability to tackle hardcore security issues such as the South China Sea dispute and more recently um, the Taiwan Straits crisis that we saw uh, in August. And the Quad is not staying, it's not sitting still. I think it was the, the former US uh, Chief of Naval Operations, Gary Ruffhead, that says that the Quad should have a standing Quad maritime force with headquarters based in Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. The third point I'd like to make is AUKUS. We all know that AUKUS formed between Australia, the UK, UK and the US, reflects ASEAN's ability, inability to cope with kind of hard power issues. And I quote Rizal Sukma, who is the former Indonesian ambassador to the UK. I don't think AUKUS puts ASEAN at the sidelines because ASEAN and by implication Indonesia is already on, on the sidelines. Uh, yeah, the last Example I like to put is, of course, the UK and other European powers when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. I mean, we, we all know uh, that the UK has been granted dialogue partner status. It wants to join the CPTPP. But we, we do know that with 
you know, such momentum that the UK, France, Germany has in terms of their Indo-Pacific strategy, it actually means that extra regional powers can actually dictate the, the narratives in, in the region and they can actually gain traction in the region at ASEAN's expense. Now, that leads me to the, the, the no answer. Does the Quad undermine ASEAN? Now, those who are old enough would have watched Tom Cruise in the movie Jerry Maguire, where there's a scene where the, the football player that he was managing said, show me the money. And I think as, you know, the Quad doesn't mind, uh, undermine ASEAN because the Quad is actually showing ASEAN the money. What do I mean by the money? Um, the, the US is actually adapting to ASEAN desires for more economics and trade. Uh, note that during the Trump era, when they mentioned free and open Indo-Pacific, it was a free and open Pacific. But towards uh, November 2020, Joseph Biden, President Biden, in a phone call with regional leaders, he actually said, free, open, secure, prosperous Indo-Pacific. And now that's playing up to ASEAN's alley because um, the next thing we know, the, the Quad was focusing on deliverables like climate change and vaccines, critical and emerging technologies. And it was Edward Kagan, who is a senior director with the National Security Council, who says that the US was looking for pragmatic solutions um, in, in ASEAN. And I think that has gone down well, as shown in our State of Southeast Asia survey that's published by my institute every year. Another example of show me the money, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Now we, know, we, we all know what that means. Uh, that's a US way of trying to say we are doing something about the economics without market access. But still, but still we have seven ASEAN member states who have signed up uh, for IPATH, and I have a veteran Thai diplomat who's saying that, well, you know, it gets us into the, joining IPATH gets us into the conversation um, there's nothing really to negotiate. There's, if there's a free trade agreement, we have to get Parliament to rectify it. But IPAF is just a talks about talks, and we can participate because we want to see what gives and what we can get uh, that benefits Thailand. Um, so, in in a sense, you know, um, ASEAN does have some some agency. Um, uh, that another example that I would cite that the Quad doesn't undermine ASEAN is that the Quad is actually bringing public goods even to the fore. I, I think it, um, not many people will have followed, but there's something called the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness Initiative that has been pioneered by the Quad, which seeks to track human uh, and weapons uh, trafficking, illegal fishing activities, and maritime militia. And it actually gives countries in Southeast Asia a good, solid maritime picture of what's happening in the Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Now, that moves me to my last point, which is, does the Quad undermine ASEAN? I'll say maybe. Why do I say maybe? Because even Southeast Asians themselves can't decide uh, whether the Quad is a good or a bad thing. I cite Southeast, the State of Southeast Asia Survey 2020. About 46% of the respondents said that the Quad was having a positive impact on Southeast Asia. Two years later, um, it goes up quite a bit to, uh, to about 59% saying that the strengthening of the Quad and tangible cooperation in vaccine security and climate change is positive and reassuring. But on AUKUS, 36% um, said that AUKUS would balance China's military power. But <clears throat> this was kind of outweighed by more guarded perceptions. 22% said that AUKUS was sparks an arms race. 18% said that it will weaken ASEAN centrality and 12% said that it weakened the MPT. So put together, perceptions of the Quad and AUKUS shows that Southeast Asians, they have a dilemma. They hope that such arrangements will help the region cope with China's growing assertiveness, yet they are worried about the consequences of such arrangements, be it triggering a regional arms race or fears that ASEAN will be undermined. So let me conclude. Um, by quoting a very famous mobster that we, we know from the Godfather series, Al Capone. And he says, do not take my kindness as weakness. 
And to, to kind of buttress what Kishaw had saying about being proactive, being confident, Al Capone said, you know, don't take my kindness as weakness. I think ASEAN can pretty much say the same thing. I mean, don't take my kindness, my desire to integrate all powers into the regional architecture as weakness because ASEAN still has agency. Why do I say ASEAN still has agency? Multipolarity, the, the, the competition between China and the US, it actually allows ASEAN to make choices. It can choose it, and it cannot choose. And it's really up to ASEAN as to which regional order it wants to pick, whether it's the AOIP, whether it wants to cherry pick aspects of FOIP and the Quad, or BRI, and, you know, which has now morphed into the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative, which we do not know the details of, but it's the way that China uh, is selling it. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.